Now over on our search results page, we can see that existing role I created before under DoorDash. Let's say I'm interested in viewing that. I'll select the view button and now the group will display. It'll include the profile photo, all the information I need about the salary and also the job description. Hello, my name is Lachlan Kirkwood and today I'll be teaching you how to build a Indeed clone entirely out of no code using Bubble. Bubble's by far one of my favorite no code tools as it not only gives you the ability to create a custom database, but it also allows you to create a custom front end design and also integrate with third party plugins and APIs. For those of you who don't know me, I've spent the past year working with the Bubble team to create their how to build blog series. This series took a list of the top products out there on the market like Airbnb, Uber and Instagram and explained the step-by-step -step process to recreating them using Bubble's no-code tool. Throughout this tutorial, I'll be explaining the exact process you'll need to follow in order to build your own job board like Indeed. This will include features like registering user accounts, creating a home page where users can search for jobs, building out a search results page to display a list of relevant jobs, then creating a function that allows users to apply for jobs, processing payments when a company publishes a job, and finally building out a dashboard that allows companies to monitor the activity of their job applications and update the status of jobs on our platform. So grab your bubble editor and let's dive right into it. The first feature of our build today won't actually be a core feature of the product itself, but instead we'll be taking the time to set up the necessary data types and fields within our database. Now I've created a notion doc here that I have added in all of the different data fields into that I'll be using to follow along. I'd recommend you also take the time to create one as well, just so you can go ahead and tick off all of these items once you've finished adding them into your database. I personally find that it just helps me keep track of the build throughout the whole process. Now what I love about Bubble is that it does give you complete control over creating your own custom database however you would like it. And you'll see how exactly we can do this as I run you through all the different data types and fields. But you'll also see that you can actually link the different data types together so you can create a truly relational database. So let's head over into our Bubble Editor and I'll walk you through the step-by-step -step process and explain each different data type and field as we add them into the application. So over in my bubble editor, I'm going to go into the data tab and the first thing I'll need to do is actually set up the different data types. As we'll need to link different data fields together, it's important to first create the different data types. So within my Notion doc, I have three different data types that I'll be using today. There's the user data type, the job data type, and then the application data type. So we'll just go ahead in our bubble editor and add in all of those data types. So there'll be one for job and there'll be another for application. Now you have probably noticed by now, but bubble itself actually comes with the user data type pre-built into it. So you don't need to actually go and add that. It will also by default come with an email field built in. So when you're registering your user's account, it has to register an email address. And it'll also store a password within that, but they just don't allow you to manipulate that field. Now we can go ahead and start adding in the data type for our user field. So we can head over to our Notion doc and we'll start by adding in the first few items here on my list, which is the name, the bio, the photo, and also the user's current job title and current company. So we'll head over into our bubble editor and I'll start adding those in. So first it was the name field, which will be a text field type. We'll go and create that. Then there'll be a photo, which will be the user's profile photo. This of course will be an image field type. Then there was the user's bio, which again will just be a simple text field. And then we'll need to store the user's current title. So this will be the current job title that they have. Again, this will be a text field, I'll create that. And also the current company that the user is working at, which again will be a text field. 
Now, if I go back into my Notion doc, I can tick off that I've added in these initial data fields and you'll see the next one that we'll need to add is actually a profile type. And the reason I'll be adding a profile type is because on our Indeed product today, we will want to actually create two different types of users. There'll be those users who are applying for jobs and then there'll be users who are companies that are listing jobs. Now these will both use the same user data type, but we'll essentially be adding additional fields that each different profile type can leverage across our platform. So if we head into our editor, we'll add in a new field and we'll call this field profile type. Now I'll be explaining later on when we register user accounts, how we can actually differentiate these users across our platform. But in the meantime, this field type itself will just be a text input field and we'll hit to create that. Now, once we've added in the option to differentiate the profile type, we'll add in some data fields that allow a user to store information about a company if they are registering as a company. So this could be things like who the current CEO is, the company size, the year it was founded, and of course, any job listings that they've published. So I'll go in and I'll add in the option to select a CEO. This will be a text field. There was also the year founded. This will be a text field. And finally, there was company size. And I will also make this a text field. Then the last field I'll be adding is a list of all the job listings that a company may post across our uh, job board. So I'll call this job listings. Now this will be able to link to the job data type that we created earlier on, which allows us to pull all of the information stored within each job that a company might post. So we'll scroll on down and select that this field type needs to be a job. And of course, because a company can post multiple job listings on our platform, we'll need to select that this is a field or a list with multiple entries. So we'll go ahead and create that. And now we've finished adding in all of the data fields for our user data type. We'll then head over to our job data type. So we'll go into our Notion doc. I'm going to just tick off that I've added in all the data fields for a user. And then I'll start adding in all of the data fields here for our job. So it'll start with the role title of the job, the description, the website link, and the salary of the job. So let's head into our editor. I'll create a new field. I'll call this role title, which will be a text input. Then there'll be an option to add a description for the job, which of course will be another text field. And I'll also add an option to include a website link, which will be a text field. But the reason I'm adding a website link is that because we're going to allow companies to post a job on our platform that can either be redirected to their own company job board if they want users to apply there, or we will also be adding an option today to allow users to apply directly on our platform. But I'd like to give companies the option for both. So I'll go ahead and create this website link data field. And then I'll go and add a salary data field. And this itself will be a number and we'll create that. Then if I head back into my notion doc, I'll start ticking off that I've added in these data fields and I can see the next option is to add in a location, a company and a job type. So I'll head over again. I'll select to add a location and this location will be a geographic address. I'll select to create that. Then what we'll need to do is link this job to a company that has published it. Now, if you remember a company is a user, so I'll select to create a new field and I'll call this company and the field type we'll be using is a user. And this will not be a list of multiple entries because only one company can publish one job at a time. So I'll create that. And the next option will be the job type. So this will be if the job is part-time, full-time or casual. So this will be a text option as well. And then if I go back over to my Notion doc, 
I can see that the next field will be an option to mark it as complete and also store applications on it. So I'll go and create a new field for complete. And this field type will actually be a yes, no field. So the job will be either complete or it won't be complete. And what I mean by complete is that the company has published a role and they've sourced someone for it. We're going to need to give them an option to mark that as complete. So that job no longer displays on our platform. So we'll select this to be a yes, no field. So it'll be one or the other. We'll go and create that. And then we'll set the default value of this to actually be no, because by default, we don't want jobs to be complete. We only want them to be marked as complete once a company has listed so within an admin dashboard. And finally, the last field I'll be adding for the job data type is a list of applications. So this will be anyone who has applied for the role. We're going to want to display a list of all of those applications that a company can search through. So we'll update the field type to be an application, which of course will link to our other data type and all of its data fields. And of course, there'll be multiple applications from multiple users. So we'll select that this is a field list with multiple entries. So we'll create that. And now we can go and tick off the rest of the data fields for our job type. And then finally, we'll set up the data type for our application. So we'll be storing in this a resume, a cover letter, and also the information of the user's current role and the current company they're in. So jump into our editor, select our application data type. And the first thing I'll do is add in an option for a resume. Now this will be a file type because we'll be allowing users to upload a PDF file that they can use as their resume. And then the cover letter will be the exact same. So we'll add in that as the field name and then select that this is a file again. I'll select to create that. And then I'm also going to want to store a user's current role. And this will be a text field. And finally, a user's current company, which will also be a text field. Now, because our data type for our application actually links to a user, so whenever a user creates an application, Bubble will store that information, as you can see here, as the creator of this application. So within our build, we actually could link these two data fields back to our user data type as we are storing that information already here. So we could essentially just say within an application that we want to see the user who applied for it, their current company size and current company. I just want to show you the option today that if a user doesn't have an account perhaps um, and they haven't registered for your platform, you can also add in additional fields so that if someone doesn't have an account and you don't have that data to pull, it just gives someone the option to add that in within their application. And finally, I'll go and tick those off in my Notion doc. And just like that, we've finished setting up our own custom database for our Indeed job board clone today. So you can really see how easy it is to go ahead and create your own custom database in Bubble with a multitude of different data fields and types that you can create. So if at any point you wish to add additional features later on after this tutorial, this should give you a good guide to understand what is possible in terms of setting up the infrastructure for those features. Now that we've finished configuring our database, let's go and take the time to jump into the list of features that we'll be working through in the tutorial today. And once again, I've created a list of all of these in Notion so that I can tick them off as we go along with our build. And you'll see here that the first feature we'll be working on is the ability to register user accounts. And as I mentioned, when we were setting up our database, particularly, we're going to need to create a way to register different accounts between those who are employers and employees. So the people looking for jobs, let's jump into our bubble editor and I'll show you how this can easily be done. Now within bubble, I do want to mention that there are a couple of different ways that you can register user accounts. And the first is by using bubbles reusable element. So if you're not familiar with that, you can head over to the drop down menu in the top left hand corner of the screen. And you'll see that there's a list of reusable elements here and also an option to create your own reusable elements. 
Reusable elements can come in handy as you only need to build an element or a component of elements once and then you can call upon them at any given time. So it'll save you having to rebuild them if you want to duplicate a particular element across multiple pages of your application. So we'll go ahead and click on the sign up login pop-up that Bubble has created by default within our reusable element list. Now you'll see that this is, as I mentioned, a pop-up element. So this will actually display over a screen. This isn't a dedicated page. But what you will see is that it already has all of your existing input fields ready to go here. So it's got the email, password, and a password configuration field. And the other thing I love about reusable elements is that if you go over to the workflow tab, you'll see that Bubble has already pre-built all of the workflows you need as well. And they've pretty much covered every single use case you'd need for a pop-up login. So there's an option to sign the user up. You can log the user in if they already have an account. There's a option to resend a password if someone's forgotten their password. So this pop-up is quite handy if you don't want to build out a dedicated landing page. In particular, I find this comes in handy if you, let's say, have a gated action on your platform. So a good example of this would be something like Instagram, where if someone who isn't a user would be scrolling through a feed and if they decide to like a post and they're not registered on your platform, you could trigger this pop-up. So that way it doesn't take them away from their current experience and it allows them to just quickly create an account and continue on with the process that they were using within your application. The way I am going to be building our registration experience today is actually not through this pop-up. Instead, I'll be creating a dedicated page. However, at any point, if you feel it's suitable, you can go ahead and also reference this pop-up and display this at any time throughout your application. As I mentioned, I won't be today, but I just think it's important for you to understand that this is an option within Bubble. So the way I'm going to be doing this is by going and creating a new page and I'm going to call this page register. And the first thing I'll do on this page is just update the background color. I personally, while I'm developing an application, just like to change the background to a light shade of gray or any different color, just in case I'm adding any white elements on the page. It allows me to just see where the constraints of the page are. Of course, you can go and update this as you need to after you finish building out your application. But then I'm going to go and just add a text field on our page and I'm going to call this register account. Now I'll go and update the style of this to be a H2 heading. Now I'm not going to be touching any of the design elements throughout this build, but if you want to go and add your own custom styles, I'd recommend doing that. I'm just going to be using Bubble's pre-built ones to get us through this tutorial, but I'll just resize that, roughly center that. And then I can go and copy this title and add in an option to register a name. Then below this, I'll go and add in an input field. I'll drag that out. And I'll update the name of this to be called input name. And then I can duplicate both of these elements. I'll drag that below. And this will register a user's email. So I'll call this heading email. I'll also then need to go and update the name of the input convention to be email. And the reason I'm doing that is because when we create a workflow, it'll make it much easier to register which input fields you want to pull data from. We'll also need to update the content format of this input field to be an email field. So it can actually register that we're recording an email address. I'll just move these headings down a bit as well so they're a bit more snug on the input fields. And then I'll go ahead and duplicate the email field. And you probably guessed it, but I'll be calling this one a password. And then I will, of course, be updating the name of this input to be called password. And I'll also update the content format of this to be a password. So now it will hide characters that are added into it. And then finally, I'm going to need to add in that option to register between the different accounts, so an employer or an employee. So I'll go and copy the password heading and I'll update the text to say account type. And then I'm going to go and add in a drop down element here. 
And then we'll just be making sure that this drop down element is a list of static choices. And we can go ahead and add in two different choices here. So the first one will be I'm looking for jobs. And then to create another choice, simply just hit the enter key, it'll add it into a new line. And then I'll say I'm looking to post jobs. So this will be where users can differentiate between being an employee or an employer. And then I'm just going to go and quickly update the styling here. I'll just move these roughly into the center. Left that heading behind. And then I will go and add a button element into our page here. And this button will just say register. And then I will select to create a workflow when this button is selected, which will register all of these fields within our database for a new user. So let's go and move into our workflow tab. And we'll create our first workflow. So we'll add in a new action. We'll be selecting from the account action. And in this case, we'll be signing the user up. Now you'll see here that we need to match the input fields on our page with the data fields within our database for a user. So we'll match the email field with our input email. So it's value. And then the password, we'll be selecting the password input fields value. Now after we've registered these two essential fields, we can also add in additional fields that we'd like to store within our database. I'm keeping this quite simple by just registering the user's name and also their profile type. So I'll select the user's name field. This will equal the input name fields value that we added onto the page. And then finally the user's profile type will equal the drop down that we added its value. Now, if a user is registering a profile type as a company looking to publish job listings, their name, of course, will be the name of the company that they work for. So after registering a user's account, there's one last thing we'll need to do to this workflow, and that is send a user to another page. Because after a user registers, we don't want them to stay stagnant on the same page. We're going to want to send them either to our home page or a settings page where they can update the rest of their profile information. In this case, I think it's quite important for users to update their profile information first before looking or publishing for jobs. So I'm going to go and send users to a settings page. So we'll go ahead and we'll add in a new action in our workflow. We'll select from the navigation option and we'll select to go to a page. Now we'll need to go ahead and create a new page first. So we'll select the add new page option. And this page will just be called settings. I'll go and create that. And then I'm not going to do anything on this page right now. I will then go back into our registration page, jump back into our workflow editor. And now with the destination page, I can select that this should be our settings page. Within this workflow, I also won't be sending any data through to this page. And just like that, we've finished building out the registration page of our application. So now a user will be able to input all of their details onto our page inputs here, select to register an account, it will do that, and then it will redirect them to a settings page where they can update the rest of their profile information. Let's quickly go and take a look at our preview to see how this functions within our bubble development environment. So I'm going to go ahead and register a new account here. I will call my name Lachlan Kirkwood. I'll add in an email address that is just test at gmail.com. I'll add in a very secure password. And then I will choose from the account type. I'm just going to say that I'm looking for jobs in this instance. And then I will register an account. And as you can see, it has registered my account. It has then gone and redirected me to my settings page here, which is exactly what we wanted it to do. And now back in our Notion doc, I'm going to go ahead and tick off that I've registered a user's account. And in particular, I've added in a function to create a point of difference between those who are employers and those who are employees. 
Now that we've finished building out the housekeeping work of our build today, we can go ahead and start to build out the core features that the end users will get to interact with. And the first one, of course, will be a home page. Now, the Indeed homepage is quite simple, and this is actually quite an easy module within this tutorial. There are a few specific little details and nuances we'll have to pay attention to, but I'll be sure to explain these in detail as we walk through each of the stages here. So let's jump into our bubble editor, and then we'll go ahead and create a new page within our app, and we'll call this page Home. Now, as I always do, I'm going to update the background color just to be a gray. And from here, we're going to keep things really simple. We're going to add in a text element here that says search roles. I'll just update that to be a H2. I'll also just reduce the size of the text box it's in. And then below this, I'll add in an input field. I'll call this input field uh, search roles. And then I'm going to go ahead and copy across the heading. And then I'll update this to be called location. And instead of adding in an input field, what I'm going to do is actually add in a search box. Now the difference with a search box from an input is that a search box, as its name states, can actually search for information to display. Now there's some circumstances where you might want to, let's say, search through a list of all the users on your platform. So you could go ahead and define a dynamic choice that would index all of the users on your platform. In this case though, we're gonna be using a separate feature and that is to index a list of addresses. Now what we'll be doing is we will updating the choices style from dynamic choices over to geographic places because this will now actually register pre-existing addresses which Bubble can pull in from a Google Maps API. I'll then also just go ahead and update the search box here to be called location. And then finally before we go ahead and create a workflow, I'm gonna add in a button element and this button will just say, find jobs. I'll just quickly tidy that up, move that down a bit, move that over, make that slightly bigger. And in terms of design, that's actually all I'm gonna be adding onto our homepage. Cause if you look at Indeed, you would understand that it's quite a simple experience. The idea I guess is they wanna get people away from the homepage as quickly as possible so they can help them find something valuable, which in this case would be the relevant job listings. Now from here, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and create a workflow when the find jobs button is clicked. And within this workflow, we're going to send a user through to a search results page. So we'll select from a navigation event and select the go to page option. And then we're going to obviously need to create a new page called search results. Now what we do is we'll just quickly add a new page, we'll call this search results, create that page. And then once this page is created, I'm going to jump back over to our home page. And now within this workflow, I will select the destination to be the search results page. And from here, what we're gonna to need to do is actually send through the data from the input fields on our page. So we'd like to obviously send through the role that the user is searching for, and then also the location that they're searching within. Now, contrary to what you might think, we're not gonna actually be sending data through this option here, because at this point, we haven't actually saved any data within our database to send through. What we are gonna do, however, is choose to send through more parameters to this page. Now, what parameters allow you to do is customize a URL string that gets sent through to the destination page. And then from here, Bubble can actually register the values that it's sent through, and you can pull that data and choose to display it on those pages. So I'll walk you through what we're gonna be doing today and I'll explain it in a little more detail as we go through. But what you can do is add in any custom parameters you would like to send through. So what we'd like to do first is send through a parameter called job title. And this will need to equal the value of the input field on our homepage, which obviously is someone searching for a particular job title. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and create a value for this parameter key. And we can do that by selecting the input value of our search roles input field. 
And now what it'll do is it'll actually register the role title that someone's searching for. So let's say they're searching for roles in social media or as a particular role, it could be a social media marketer. They'll be able to send that data through to our search results page and we can customize what job listings will display based on the value of this parameter. Then finally, we'll just need to add one last parameter to this page, and that is the location in which a user is searching for a role. Because obviously, we'll only want to display the roles that are in a close proximity to that user. So what we can do is add in another key here, and we'll call this location. And the value of this location will, of course, be the input value of our search box we've added. Now, because a search box will actually index a proper address, so it'll index the number of an address, the street name, and also the city, we might instead just want to generalize the location that a user is searching for down to a city level. And there's a simple way we can do this. We can, after we've added in that we want to pull the data from the search box locations value, we can search for an option here called extract. And because this search box is formatted as a geographic address, it'll allow us to extract which particular value we want to send through to our search results page. In this instance, I'm going to want to extract the city value. And now it'll just send through the unique value of that city, which again, will be able to identify any jobs on our search results page that are within a certain range of that city. So now if I head back into our bubble editor, we'll go ahead and actually experiment with how this all functions. So from passing through the values of our input fields and our location, sending that through to our search results page, and I'll show you how those values are stored within our URL strings. So I'll go ahead and start by searching for a role, I'll call it social media, and the location will be San Francisco. And you can see that it is automatically pulling in all of the options for San Francisco. And if you wanted to add in a specific address, it would also index those. But because of the extraction we've added into our URL parameter, it'll only just be exporting anything of these on a city level. So we'll select San Francisco, choose to find jobs. And you can now see that we've been redirected to our search results page, but also at the same time, it has sent through the value of our query, so social media in this case. And then it's also sent through the value of the location, so San Francisco. And just like that, we've finished the build for the first core feature within our product. After building out our home page, we can finally go ahead and finish building out the search results page that we created before within our application. So we'll head on over to our bubble editor and jump on over to the search results page that we created before. And like always, I'll go ahead and just quickly update the background color to be a light shade of gray. And similar to last time, I will go ahead and add in a heading menu here. Only this time I won't be adding in a completely static heading. What I'm going to want to do is actually insert a dynamic heading, which pulls in the information from the user's query that they're searching for. So in this case, if you remember, we were storing the parameters from our home page, which was the job title and the location that the users were searching within. I'd like to pull and display that information on this page just to reconfirm that the user is searching for those particular values. So I'll start by adding in a title that says Git. Then I want to insert dynamic data. So this could be things like Git social media marketing jobs. So I'll insert data. I will scroll right down to the bottom to the option that says Git data from page URL. And then you can see that we can actually pull data from the page parameter that we'd set before. Now, if you were to go to your home page and then jump back into the workflow editor, you can see the parameters that we've previously created. So there's two, there's one for the job title and another for the location. I'll go ahead and copy the job title parameter key. And then we're going to go back over to our search results page, head to our design tab. And then I can finish displaying which data we want to pull from our URL parameter. So I will paste in the option to pull in data from the job title parameter. And then I will add in some more static text. So it'll say get job title jobs within 
and then I'm going to want to display the location parameter. So once again, we'll insert dynamic data. I will go down to the bottom, select the get data from page URL option. And the parameter in this case was just called location. Now I will go and update this to just be a H2 style heading, just so it's a little larger. So the next thing I want to do is add in a list of all the jobs across our platform that match the same values of this URL parameter. So what we'll do is we'll head over to our element option here and add in a repeating group element. Now repeating groups are by far one of my favorite elements within Bubble and what they allow you to do is display a list of dynamic options. So say for instance you wanted to display a list of all the jobs across our platform. We could simply add in the value of one job that we'd like to display and then it will pull all of the rest of the jobs and display those in the same format. So the first thing we'll need to do with a repeating group is update the actual type of content that it will display. In this instance, we'll be wanting it to display a job. And then once we've identified that we're displaying a list of jobs, we need to give it a data source that allows it to identify which specific jobs we want it to display. So in this case, we'll select a data source. We will perform a search. So select the do a search for option. And now we will select the job option. So as it stands, this repeating group is now going to display a list of all of the jobs that have been published across our platform, which we don't actually want that to be the case right now. We only want it to display a list of the active jobs that match the title and the location of a user's query. So let's go in and add some constraints so it can refine the search of jobs that it will need to display. The first thing I want to do is select the complete option for a job as I'm only going to want to display a list of jobs that are currently active. So in this instance, we'll only be displaying jobs where the complete status equals no. Bear in mind that later on, we're going to be building a feature that allows employers to update the status to yes. Then we'll want to add another constraint, which will be the role title. And we'll want this to contain the value of the URL parameter that we've sent through. So again, we'll scroll right down to the bottom, select the get data from page URL option. And the page parameter in this case was called job title. I'll close that. And then we'll add in another constraint, which identifies the location of the role that we want to display. So in this case, it will be the location. And then we will select is within. And you can customize this to whatever distance you would like. But in this case, I'm going to say when the location of a job that's been published is within 10, I'll go and select kilometers of the location that a user is searching for. So then I will select the option to get data from page URL. And of course, the page parameter I'm going to need to pull data from is the location. So now I can go ahead and actually structure the format of this repeating group. And you'll soon see how powerful these elements can be and get an idea for how they work. So what I'm going to want to do is just reduce the size of this. So it's about half the page, move our heading over so it's in line with it. And then when I format this repeating group, I'm going to update it to only display two rows to begin with. And then I'll update the layout style to be extended vertical scrolling. So what this allows it to do is actually expand out or shrink based on how many jobs it needs to actually display. Then from here, I can go and start to add in the content I'd like to display for each job listing. So I'll start by adding in a title. I'll go and insert dynamic data that displays the current cells jobs job title. I'll go and update this to be a H2 style heading. And I'll also just move that up to the top of the repeating group. Below this, I might want to display the company who is currently recruiting for this job. So I'll insert another heading, I'll insert dynamic data and say the current sales jobs creator or company. In this case, I'm going to choose company because we did add the option to update that when a company was submitting a new job listing. So I'll select the company. I'll update this heading to be a H3 dark. And I'll just move that down a bit. So there's a bit of space between those headings. And then below this, I'm going to copy that heading 
and I'm going to want to display the role type of this job, so whether or not it's part-time, full-time, or contract. So I will display the current sales jobs job type. And finally, I might also like to display when this job listing was posted so a user can see how long it's been active for on our platform. So once again, I'm going to copy one of these headings. I will set it so it's in line with the rest. And I'll be displaying the current sales jobs. And you can scroll down and find an option called creation date. So now it's going to show the exact date and time that this job was posted. But furthermore, we can go and format this so it will just display a particular date and you can choose however you want to display that. So I might choose that I want it to display in this format. And then finally, within our repeating group, I'm going to want to add one last thing and that is a button that will allow a user to actually view this job listing. So I'll put that that says view. I'll move that over. And then I'll go and just shrink the repeating group so everything fits in quite nicely. And at the moment you can see that we're displaying a list of just the overview of a job, including the title, the company, the type of role it is, and also the date it was published. But we aren't at the moment displaying the full information of a role. And the way we can do that is by actually including another group element onto this page. So let's go and add in a group here to the side of this repeating group. And from here, we'll just need to take a moment to configure a few settings on this group. And the first one is that we're going to need to unselect that this element is visible on page load because we don't want this to display until a user selects the view button. And then we'll also want to collapse this group when it's hidden because we don't want it to actually take up any space when it's not needed. Then from here, what we'll need to do is update the type of content that this group is. Now, because we'd like to display the full details of a job listing when it's, this view button is clicked, the type of content for this group will in fact be a job. Now, although we've updated the type of content for this group to be a job, the group currently doesn't know or have an understanding of which job to display. So what we'll need to do is somehow send the data through from this repeating group over into this group when it's needed from a user's click on our view button. Now, the way we can do this is by using custom states in Bubble. And states are a powerful way to set data within your application. And I'll be explaining to you exactly how we can do this. So if we head over into our group element here, you'll see there's an option to select this information icon here. If we click that, it'll allow us to create a custom state. So we'll go ahead and select to create a custom state. Now states can contain any different type of data or feature that you would like. In this case though, I'm going to set my state to be a job. So that way when someone selects a job from the repeating group, I will set the state across my application to register that specific job. And then of course I will display that specific job within my group element. So I'm going to go ahead and call this state current role because this will be the current role that a user wants to view. I'll go ahead and create that. And now what we'll need to do is create a way for this state in our application to measure the value of a repeating group element here when it's clicked. So once again, a user scrolling through their job feed here, they see a particular role they like, they click the view button, we want to set the state and record what job role they're currently looking at, so the current role, and then we'll want to display that information in this group. So we'll go ahead and create a workflow when this view button is selected. And then in our element actions, what we'll want to do is search for state, and we'll choose to set the state of an element. The element will of course be our group job, the group we've just created. And the custom state will be the current role state that we've just added. Now remember that the current role state we created is linked to a job type within our database. So it will need a value of a job, which of course will be the current sales job from our repeating group. And then back over in our design tab, we'll go back into our group 
And we'll need to add a data source now to this group because it currently knows that it needs to display a job. It has the option to save a state of a current job. We'll just need to allow it to register what job it needs to display once a state has been set. So the data source will be the group job, so the group itself, its current role, so that is the state. Now every time that that state is updated when this view button is clicked, the current role will also update and it will display the information within our group here. Now before we go and add any elements into our group, there's one last thing we'll need to do to configure this properly and that is add a condition to actually display the group. Because if you remember, we've unselected that this element is visible on page load because I don't want it to be displayed until a user actually selects a job that they'd like to read more about. So let's jump over to our conditions tab here and we'll define a new condition and this condition will register when the group job, its current role, which is its state that we've just created, is not empty. So whenever there is a current role saved as its state, it will display this group. And we'll choose the behavior to select that this element is visible. And of course, we'll be selecting that that should be true. And just like that, this group will function quite nicely now. We'll just need to go ahead and add in some elements into this group to help us display a specific role when it is selected. So I'm just going to go ahead and make this group a little larger. So I'll move it over a bit. I'll also expand that out. And I'll go ahead and the first thing I'm going to want to add is an image element. Now this will be the image of the brand that has published this role. So I will add in dynamic data and the dynamic data for this will be the parent group's job. So the creator of this job, so the company who has published this job, I'd like to display their photo. I'll just move that up a bit. Then I'll add in a text element beside this. And I'd like for this to display the parent group's job, its role title. I'll also go ahead and update that to be a H2 style heading. And I'll just move that across as well so it's not overlapping our image element there. Then I'm going to add another text element below the job title. And this will want to display the creator of this job, so the company who has published it. So I'll select from the parent group's jobs creator, their name, which of course, if a user is registered as a company, that will be the company name. And then below this, I'll add one last text element. And I'd like this element to display the salary listed for this role. So I'll start by backspacing any content that we have in there. I'll add in a dollar symbol, and then I'll go ahead and insert dynamic data that selects from the parent group's jobs, salary. Then finally, I'll add in another text element and this will be the description of the job. So I'll insert dynamic data that selects from the parent group's jobs description. Now again, you can make this description a single line and it will expand based on how much content it actually has stored within this job listing. And then the last thing I'll need to add is a button element here. And this button will display apply. I'll just make that a tiny bit smaller. And then from here, I can go ahead and just reduce the size of this group because once again, all of these line elements will expand if they have more content within them. So at the moment, this page is quite functional and it will pull in any information from a user's search query. It will display a list of all the relevant roles and when a user would like to learn more about a specific role, they can click the view button and it will display all that information in a panel next to it. There is however one last feature I'd like to add and that is the ability to add in some additional filters to help users refine their job search. And these filters could be things like a salary or even the role type, so whether they want a part-time or full-time role. So I'm gonna go ahead and select to move these items down 
And then above that, I'm going to go ahead and add in a drop down menu right below our title on our page here. And then I'll update the placeholder text for this drop down to say roll type. And this will be a list of static choices. And what I'll need to do is go ahead and copy the exact same text that I had used on the submission page. So I'll head over to our submit page here. I'll scroll down to the roll type drop down menu and I'll go ahead and just copy all of those options. I'll head back to our search results page and I will paste those in. And again, these will all need to be the exact same characters, whether it's using capital letters or not, because when you're refining the search, we will be measuring it against the input values from when a company submitted a job. And then beside this, what I will do is also add in another input field. And I'll update the placeholder of this to indicate that it is to search for a salary. And then I'll also update the content format here to be a currency because of course we're displaying a dollar figure. Now when a user decides to refine any of these options here, we're going to need to update and make changes to the data source of this repeating group. Because if you remember the data source is only searching for the role title that matches the user's query, same with the location and also jobs that are currently still active on our platform. What we will need to do though is add in some additional constraints that allow this repeating group to match the input values of these input fields here. And the way we'll be doing this is by adding in some conditions. So let's head over to our condition tab within our repeating group. And then from here we will define a new condition. And the first condition we'll create will match the role type drop down value here. So we'll select that when the role type drop down, so the drop down role type, when its value is not empty, we'll want to update the data source of this repeating group. And the data source will need to do a search. And this will be much the same as the original data source that we've added to the repeating group. Only this time we'll be adding one more constraint to match the value of this dropdown. So we'll go ahead and select the data type to be a job. We'll add in both the existing constraints that we had already. So it'll be that the complete status equals no. The job title or the role title contains, I'll scroll down to the last option, which is get data from page URL. And the parameter was job title. Close that. And then I will also need to select from the location. So when the location is within 10 kilometers, I'll then go and get more data from the page URL. The parameter in this case will be a location. And now we'll go ahead and add an additional constraint for our dropdown element here. So we'll select that the job type will need to equal the same value as the dropdown element here. Now this will help us refine the total searches by the role type which means that we'll also need to add another option to cater for our salary input. So once again, we'll need to go and define another new condition. And the trigger for this will be when the input salary, its value is not empty. And then once again, we'll be updating the data source of our repeating group we will do a search for, we'll be displaying a job again. And of course we'll be adding in the same constraints as before. So when the complete status equals no, when the role title contains the same value from our URL parameter, which is our job title, And then when the location 
is within 10 kilometers of, and then I will scroll down to get data from page URL, and the parameter for location was location. And now the additional constraint here is when the salary, and then I will choose from the equals or is greater than the input salaries value. So let's say there's two roles on our job board here. One has a salary of 50K, the other has a salary of 60K, and a user is searching for a minimum salary of 55K. It will now remove the 50K job role and only display the 60K role. And because we're using the is equal to and greater than convention, if the user was also to include a salary of 60K, that 60K job would also still display. Now we've gone ahead and added in two conditions here to match the individual inputs of our drop-down menu and our input field. What we will need to do though is create a third condition that registers when both of these input fields aren't empty. So we'll head into our conditions, we'll define a new condition and we'll start by selecting from the drop-down. So when its value is not empty, and then we'll select the AND option, and we'll be selecting from the input salaries value when it is not empty. So now you can see this condition will only trigger when both of these input fields aren't empty. And then once again, I'm going to need to update the data source of this repeating group now. I will do a search for, I'll search for jobs, I'll start by adding in those constraints again. So when the complete status equals no, when the role title contains, I'll scroll down to the get data from page URL option. The page parameter is called job title. I'll grab the location again. When the location is within 10, kilometers of get data from page URL. The parameter name is location. Then I'll add in both constraints for both of these input fields. So we'll start with the drop down option. So it'll be when the job type equals the value of the drop down role type. And then the salary of the role should be equal to or greater than the input of the salary field here. And just like that, now it has catered for every single scenario here with our input fields. And if you would like to go ahead and add in any additional filters yourself, you'll just need to define a new condition within our repeating group to cater for that option. So now I'm just gonna go ahead and grab the group in the repeating group. I will move those up just so they're not so far down. And now I'll go ahead and test out what this whole experience looks like within our development environment. So back on my homepage, I'm going to search for a role. I'll search for a social media role within San Francisco. I'll go ahead and punch in that query. Now over on our search results page, we can see that existing role I created before under DoorDash. Let's say I'm interested in viewing that. I'll select the view button and now the group will display. It'll include the profile photo, all the information I need about the salary and also the job description. And then I can also go ahead and refine the type of role I'm looking for if I'd like. So this role itself is listed as a full-time role, but let's say I want to only find part-time roles. You'll see that that then disappears from our repeating group. If I update that to be full-time again, it will display once again. And then if I update the salary here, this salary is listed as $60,000. So if I was to update the salary to be $60,000, you'll see that it is equal to that salary, so it still displays. But if I was to go and add one more dollar to that, you'll see that it no longer displays there. And just like that, we've finished building out our search results page, which includes the ability to add some additional features that users can refine their job search by, and then also an option to display the role in full detail in a hidden group. 
And that is all I have time for in this tutorial today. If you're interested in checking out the rest of the course, I'd recommend clicking the link in the description to purchase the full course. Within the complete course, I'll be walking you through the step-by-step -step instructions to complete the rest of our build. You can also get access to a suite of bubble tutorials where you'll learn how to build other popular products. If you'd like to get started building some other popular products for free, I'll be sure to include some suggested links at the end of this video. Thanks again for taking the time to watch, and be sure to hit that subscribe button if you'd like to see any other useful tutorials to help you on your bubble journey.